So uh, I'm Dan Otterman from the Department of Molecular Biology here at Princeton. I know most of you. It's uh, actually the case that we put this session on, so I get to say hello to my many friends and colleagues of the pediatric and the academic, that's right, academic medicine community here in New Jersey. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Rich for putting on this uh, great series of programs on healthcare in New Jersey. It's been a real pleasure to work with you, Rich, and, and your organization. I know it's uh, been a little bit expensive uh, for you, and I don't, so I don't know if we'll be doing it again, but uh, that's right. I have my wallet right here. I was paying for it until October. Now you're paying for it. So uh, what we've heard is really um, very sobering. Uh, and for someone like myself who spent their life uh, in New Jersey and practiced here for uh, quite a while, it's not a surprise. I think what we've just heard today is not a surprise for the many uh, physicians, many pediatricians, family practitioners, um, uh, workers from the state. I see many people from the Department of Health here. We all know that we have problems in New Jersey, but what uh, Ed has just told us uh, crystallizes them, puts numbers on them. Um, and uh, it's going to be our job through the rest of the today's session to try to understand these numbers, to understand why, in Ed's phrase, we seem to place, at least at the systems level, such a low priority on uh, children's health. I did want to turn this on. How, how do I do that? Um, why we seem to place such a low priority, and what we can do in our state to increase the priority of children among the many, uh, the manifold uh, uh, burdens on the state. What can we do? So I've put here, I don't believe any symposium is complete without a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And so I've put this up. I'm not going to read it to you. You can all read as well as I can. So while I'm chattering away, uh, please feel free to, to look this over. This is the, the quote that I used to start my class on children's care at uh, Princeton. So I think it's, it's, um, it's it's essential today to try to understand what we can do to make children a higher priority. And what we're going to hear today, I, I think, is we're going to learn somewhat uh, of the role of some of our very difficult inner city uh, milieus. How, how much of a role does the context of a Camden City or a Newark or an Elizabeth or a Patterson or Plainfield, how much of a role does that play in the very sobering uh, statistics we saw? What solutions tried and practiced elsewhere, even in Iowa? Uh, <laughs> a, a place, actually, of which I'd never heard until this morning. <laughs> even in Iowa, uh, can, uh, can work in New Jersey. Um, we're going to hear from uh, one of our speakers, probably several of our speakers, but one in particular, about the medical home. What is the importance of a medical home? How can we enhance access to a medical home? Uh, we're going to hear uh, from uh, Deb Briggs and others um, about the importance of training programs. Uh, how important is it that uh, our state have training programs for pediatricians, for pediatric surgeons, subspecialists who care for children? Uh, does our state medical university, uh, and I do see some representatives from our state medical university, UMDNJ, have a special obligation, have a special obligation to the taxpayers and the citizens, special role in trying to improve the care of our children? Finally, and this sort of foreshadows what I've put there, I think that our state's response to this very poor showing, this really embarrassing showing in this report that we've heard. Um, remember, um, we are the second wealthiest state in the United States, and I think we still are the second wealthiest state in the United States. And I think, um, and I'm quite sure uh, because of where I'm standing today, that we're the best educated state uh, in the United States. So it's particularly galling uh, that we uh, rank 41st out of 50 in how we take care of our future. Particularly galling. So I think that our state's response to this very poor showing will, to a large extent, determine the future of our state. It'll determine what corporations want to move to New Jersey, because the children of the workers need to get medical care. It'll determine how healthy our population is in the future. We can't, uh, if we can't educate our children, if we, can't, if we can't keep our children healthy, we can't educate them, we can't have a modern workforce. The future of our state is the future of our children, and so we must do better uh, in this regard, and I hope today will tell us, or begin to tell us how. Finally, on a moral uh, basis, our response to what we hear today, our response as a state and as citizens, uh, will also tell us what kind of state we want to be 
and actually, to a large extent, what kind of people we are. So the speakers today have been selected, and we're very grateful for uh, all of them who have come, for their ability to speak to these issues, for their research that furthers our understanding of the social and health policies that must be part of the solution, and because of their advocacy, frankly, their strong advocacy in the surface of our nation's children. Our first, uh, or the, our second speaker, the first that I'm introducing, uh, is Renee Jenkins, who is a professor of pediatrics and child health at Howard University, the former chair, and an adjunct professor of pediatrics at George Washington University in Washington. At Howard, her research focuses on adolescent pregnancy prevention. Her publications and presentations range from adolescent health and sexuality to violence prevention, health issues of minority children. She's currently the principal investigator at Howard for the DC Baltimore Research Center on Child Health Disparities in collaboration with Children's National Medical Center, Hopkins Pediatric Department, and Primary Care Division of DC Health Department. Dr. Jenkins is a national figure. She became president of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, in 2007. She's a member of the American Pediatric Society, Ambulatory Pediatric Association, Institute of Medicine, National Academy. Renee, it's really a very great personal honor for me to be able to introduce you to the audience of Princeton. Thank you. I want to put a mic on you. I have it. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just tell the story. Okay, great. This is my first talk as the American Academy of Pre Pediatrics president once removed. I stepped down about two days ago, so <laughs> I'm you? in a new mode. Is this you? Yep, that's me. Uh oh. I hate Vista. Okay, there we go. Thank you. And it's just, this, I can do it. Yes, this. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I really feel very welcome. I see a, a number of my colleagues here who uh, uh, I've worked with over the years, and even uh, someone who we were residents together many, many years ago. Um, but uh, uh, very much uh, look forward to dialoguing with you. And uh, first of all, to say I'm so happy the uh, New Jersey chapter of the Academy is involved in this because I really think that's what's going to solve some of the uh, challenges that we have before us. Do we have all of us at the table who really can help make the changes? Um, not only what we do in, in terms of care, but also what we do in terms of advocacy. Because I really believe, as, as Ed sort of pointed out to you, these are about system changes, and many of them are changes that we must have our uh, state governments um, respond to, and, and our responsibility is the advocacy for that. Um, what I'm going to try to cover in the time that I have with you is uh, everybody here is not a member of the Academy, and, and Dan told me there are going to be some students here, so I thought I should put a little bit of a plug in for us. Um, talk a little bit about the global ranking, so what's the U.S. look like in context, and Ed's really started that discussion going. Um, and then uh, look at what the Academy is doing. And what I sort of saw as some of the common themes and what we were looking at in terms of what some of the success successful interventions are. First of all, the Academy's mission is this by way of uh, commercial, but also by way of understanding orientation to how we look at this. We look at it in a very broad way, not medical per se, but health in a much broader sense. Um, and not just physical health, but, but mental and social health also. But we also, obviously, as an organization, look forward to supporting our pediatricians because we feel in supporting them, they can also uh, deliver better care to children. Our vision is that children will have optimal health and well being and that children are valued. And so, again, sort of a core value for the organization as well as the value of uh, quality care and assisting our members in giving the best care they can to children. Uh, a, a quote, as Dan said, he likes to start out with sort of an orientation quote, and I like this from the UNICEF's uh, study. And basically, it tells us that, again, 
Um, it's a measure of our nation as to how we treat our children, how we uh, treat them in terms of health and safety, material security, education, socialization, and their sense of being loved and valued and included into the families and societies into which they were born. And that picture is my statement about it. That's my grandson when he was like three weeks old. So uh, I, I definitely have uh, uh, identified with that statement. So um, Ed gave you uh, some of the child well-being um, data that's available across countries. And this is yet another look at um, data globally, um, but looking specifically at uh, uh, rich countries, industrialized countries. And in the UNICEF survey, they basically looked at these six dimensions. And um, again, because child well-being is not just medical or education, but it's a global sense there. What you see here, and because the writing is small, I circled it. Um, once again, there we are, near the bottom in ranking. Um, the comment that the professor made about, you know, what about single payer people? Uh, the UK is at the bottom. So there are some issues here, I think, in terms of how this gets interpreted for children. Um, but we see that not only is the US next to the bottom overall, but it's dead last in terms of health and safety. Um, one uh, analysis of this from Paul Wise at Stanford was he actually took the um, data in terms of the ranking and um, put it on a graph against something called a Gini coefficient. And what that is, is a, uh, some of you know, a measure of the inequity in income across a society. So the more difference there is in the bottom and the top, um, the, the smaller the Gini coefficient. So you see in countries in which there's a large disparity in income, they uh, have the lowest ranking. So I think that, again, is a statement about prioritizing children and uh, uh, the society's uh, emphasis on uh, child well-being. Under health and safety, these are just the um, measures that were used to get the health and safety ranking. So you'll understand, I think you've already talked about the fact that our infant mortality is among the highest. I think the average in this study was like 4.7 and, and we're somewhere 6.8 to 7 all the time. Um, and then again, our immunization uh, uh, rates and we have major new challenges to that, which I'm going to go over with you very briefly. And then uh, deaths from accidents and injuries, which were also in that measure. When we look at access, um, we see, again, um, that we're talking about, depending on which year you look at it, between uh, 8.8 .8 and 9 million children. But I think what is um, important to underline is these children live very often with at least one full-time working parent. So these are not just uh, parents who are on welfare or home uh, unemployed. These are parents who are actually working and cannot afford insurance. Um, even though they work, many of them are still below the poverty line. And we still have a, a major challenge in that we have eligible children that have not been able to be captured and enrolled. Or the other issue is that they enroll and they become disenrolled because they don't have sufficient um, um, information about re-enrollment or the re-enrollment uh, process is onerous. Uh, it seems as though uh, many states, their strategy for containing costs are to have a system whereby people get thrown off the rolls on an ongoing basis. So I think there are some real system issues that can, need to be addressed in terms of some of these challenges. What we see here is that when we look at uh, insured children that we're seeing the beginning of a trend where employer-based coverage is reduced and we're seeing higher rates of public coverage. But again, I don't think that's a surprise given what's been happening in our general economy in terms of unemployment and people not just not electing to get covered but people not being employed. And so this is certainly uh, putting a, an, an increased burden on states relative to the number of children that they have to cover. When we look at some of these indicators, it's important to look at them across time, because I think sometimes we're um, so busy looking at the negative, we don't see the areas in which we have made some progress. 
As you see here for infant mortality, the direction, although almost a plateau, um, is starting a little bit creeping in the direction we don't want to see for infant mortality. And I think uh, some of the newer data also suggest it is going in that direction, make, being maintained. Um, the child deaths, teen deaths, and teen births uh, had been going down. Um, this data is from 2005, even though Annie Casey brought it out in 2008. You know, they're always behind with the federal data some. But the um, at least data that we have um, suggested through looking at D.C., for example, where I am, the teen birth rates are starting to edge up again in D.C. So I think, you know, we can never stand back and, and take our foot off the pedal, but it's important for us to uh, be aware of the trends in terms of some of these areas across the nation. So let's now say, you know, why isn't this working for children? I think Ed brought forth the data that suggests it's not just that it's not working for children, it's not working from a larger system perspective. And um, this, again, is another look at the data that Ed presented. Um, but when you look at the 2006 uh, data, which is in the light blue color, and the 2008 data, which is in the black line, you see that in uh, areas of healthy lives, quality, access, uh, and equity, we are going, you know, equity's improved. Uh, those other ones are going in the wrong direction. Healthy lives, um, quality, and access. When we look at efficiency, there have been some improvements in 2008 in efficiency. And as you see in equity, looking at disparities, there have been some improvements. So it's never a homogeneous, but um, certainly looking at what kind of interventions have occurred, especially um, in the areas around uh, efficiencies and, and what's been happening in the hospital-based efficiencies particularly, um, we are making some progress. It's just that we need to be aware that the system into which the children's uh, system fits is not necessarily a well-functioning system either. So let's go to what the Academy is doing around some of these real specific issues. And this is, um, I, I know we have some Academy uh, current officers and, and previous officers here. This is our icon, and it's really a dynamic um, diagram because we change it and we look at it each year. Um, what we do is we essentially look at uh, areas in which there are planning activities, areas in which there are major implementation activities, and then those areas in which are, they are going to be integrated into the overall uh, functioning of the academy. We also tell people this is not the only thing that we do. Um, so just keep that in context. And in fact, there are areas here um, that are no longer reflected that we've actually moved off the icon because we've begun to make progress and integrate them into the academy's functioning. And those areas are tobacco, for example, and obesity. We have major efforts uh, now embedded within the activities of the academy around these issues. So these are only our real active issues, as you see posted here. Our most active is actually uh, in the area under the vision of pediatrics, which is what we're undertaking uh, starting next month in a study that will probably go on for at least 24 months in terms of looking at the external environment and its impact on pediatric practice. When we look at foster care under our special needs, we know that there are um, a considerable number approximating a million children in foster care and that there are four times as many that are actually being taken care of by members of their families. But there are most vulnerable uh, children and for them the systems very often are non-functional. And so we have taken time to look at how we might improve systems of care for foster children. We have a foster care task force that includes not only pediatricians but uh, families um, foster uh, care agency families. We also have juvenile court judges because they are again part of the major system in terms of what happens to these children in care. And so the areas that we're focusing on are really improving the uh, resources that are available for people trying to function within the current foster care system as well as look forward to advocacy uh, opportunities for us to improve the quality of care in the foster care system. We're also looking at oral health, and we had at our national meeting uh, a session for a half a day uh, called PEDS 21 on oral health. 
And when we talked about chronic disease, the uh, dentists are, are really always on us, and, and the people who are active in oral health, to say dental caries are a chronic disease. And when we um, uh, it had that session, we also learned, for example, that it's one of the most common reasons children miss days in school are from dental caries and, and poor oral health. And so oral health is not a limited aspect the way I think very often many of us grew up or were educated about oral health, but it is, has a much broader perspective. There also is an association between uh, periodontal disease and low birth weight in mothers. And so we're starting to look a lot more at the impact of oral health on the overall uh, health and well-being of children. Our oral health objectives, uh, again, uh, have to do with uh, looking at the critical research in oral health and making sure that uh, pediatricians know about it. Uh, we have chapters that are really doing um, a lot of advocacy around oral health as well as training uh, pediatricians in areas of low resource areas for uh, oral health professionals. They're doing uh, fluoride varnish, they're doing um, uh, sealants and they're getting reimbursed for Medicaid for these procedures. And so there is a real uh, move because I think of the limited number of health professionals in oral health for us to really do some preventive um, care um, steps in oral health, which obviously if they're successful will reduce um, the need for um, uh, serious uh, interventions for children as well as reduce the cost of repairing and restoring um, of the dent dental care issues with children. When we look at mental health, we um, are again challenged by the lack of health professionals uh, who specialize and who are available for referral for mental health conditions. And so um, what we are looking at, I think, are new models. We had a conversation about this last night, and I don't know if you've invited in the, I think you have, the. Uh, Massachusetts people in terms of looking at the systems of care in terms of how do you address the situation in which there are a shortage of mental health professionals. There are also, I think, cultural issues which we can't deny about why some of our parents uh, who are referred to mental health services don't go. And so co-location of mental health services in the context of preventive health and, and uh, uh, standard uh, health care is also an important consideration for how to bring uh, parents and families uh, and children into uh, mental health services. So our mental health objectives are around uh, diagnosing, assessing, and treating, but also um, helping uh, pediatricians know that if you assess, there will be someone for you to refer to. Because many of the, uh, of the pediatricians have said to us, why do I want to get a toolkit and start assessing these kids if I really don't have anybody to send them to? And so it really is a, um, sort of a unit of, of intervention that we really have to, to take under consideration. Immunizations. I think I spent more time during my presidency on immunizations. I could not believe it. I'm an adolescent medicine person. This is not an area that I tread into. Um, so uh, I learned a lot, but I also took a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to really uh, help us move forward in, in some of the challenges that now exist around immunizations. When immunizations were first brought back onto the um, uh, Agenda for Children icon, it really was around the issues here in the business case for pricing, immunization financing, issues like that. But um, as you see here under the objectives, uh, advocating for policies that proactively sustain and improve vaccination levels became, I think, one of the more central issues uh, in our work in immunizations. What we see here is some data from uh, Washington State provided to us by Ed Marcuse that looked at the philosophical exemptions or the total exemptions, but they have a philosophical exemption uh, um, opportunity for parents in Washington State. And if you look here in 2004, the red being where there are counties with greater than 5% of parents uh, refusing vaccines, that over the, the uh, three-year um, sets of data that he had, this is 2004, we look at 2005, 2006, 
and then we look at 2006 and 7, and we see counties uh, in the upper north area as high as 30.5 percent um, refusal rates. And we know that this is a real threat to the community in terms of the herd immunity in that community, so that there are many more children that are now vulnerable to vaccine preventable diseases. In response to um, our concern around this, um, expressed at our uh, uh, annual leadership forum, we actually joined in a campaign with an organization known as Every Child by Two. Um, it was started by Rosalind Carter and Betty Bumpers. It's been ongoing for almost 20 years, and they really, their efforts were to get children immunized appropriately by age two. We know that a lot of kids, by the time they get to preschool, they're immunized, but they are not always on time up to age two. And on this website, there are also public, a public service announcement that can be ordered um, um, by people who wish to advocate for uh, uh, vaccinating your children. And it, they are excellent PSAs, and they actually show some of the childhood diseases. I think sometimes with immunizations, we're victims of our own success. Uh, many uh, young mothers have never seen these diseases, and the other people who have never seen it are our residents. So the residents and pediatrics, when they're trying to convince a mother to, um, that vaccines are safe and that when you, on balance, when you look at the diseases, they've never seen children with these diseases. So it really is difficult for them. And so I think trying to uh, help educate our residents and to really give them, uh, many of them take opportunities to go abroad uh, and go to developing countries so they can get a chance to see some of these things. So I think that that's really been a major challenge for us nationally, and I'm sure I hear about the challenge it's been for New Jersey also. Now, what we have done over the past two to three years that I think has really um, helped us is that we've really reached out to some uh, other national partners in our effort to bring attention to children's issues. And this is um, a photograph, and, and Jay Berkelhammer, we tease him all the time um, because people think these are cardboard cutouts of, of uh, <laughs> Bush and Clinton. <laughs> but they're not, they're real people. He actually went to a dinner with them. I didn't get to go there this year, but he went. So, uh, but again, a bipartisan effort. You know, we need to, to strike a, a note on both sides of the aisle in our state legislatures as well as at our federal uh, congressional levels um, around issues related to children and try to really uh, move um, these bodies in that direction. And as you can see here, America's Promise has again very broad brush issues for children, not just their health, but their ability to have good role models, their ability to know that they're loved and, and, and cared for, and that there are people who are going to support their development, um, and especially for our adolescents, opportunities to help others. This is really part of America's Promise. They are currently doing a 50-state, 50 50-city 50 effort uh, around school dropouts, high school dropouts, and really trying to look at how they can get young people um, to stay in school and to complete their education. Our other partner who, that has really been interesting um, has been the business interest partners. And we are partnering with the Partnership for America's Economic Success. And um, Rob Duggar, who heads this, has been to our uh, national meeting as well as to our legislative conference. And most recently, we took our leadership to their, to their Telluride conference. This is a journal, if you can imagine, from The Economist who are looking at the case for early investment in our kids. We want these guys on our side. They know how to frame the message. Um, and so right now they have something called the Telluride Principles that were just recently passed uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago in September uh, when we had a joint meeting with them. And again, these are very broad principles about maximizing life success involving parents, um, looking at performance evaluations, again, our concept of evidence base, but also investing early in children. And James Heckman was actually a Nobel, Nobel laureate in econ ec economics who addressed our national conference last year. So again, these are the kind of partners that you really want to build. I think very often when you come out as pediatricians or as teachers and you're the advocates, they're saying, well, it's obviously in your best individual interest. But when you have economists coming out saying that it really is in the best interest of this country's future to do that, I think you get a, a different set of listening ears very often. 
So the other part of it, um, going from the national to the state level, that I just wanted to bring up knowing that you were going to be talking about what state level um, opportunities there are, were just to have our state office sort of talk about what, or give me some information on what different states are doing. Uh, many of them are doing work uh, to imp improve access to care, uh, especially around eligibility issues, about uh, streamlined processes to keep people on the rolls once they get on the rolls. And we have New Jersey on here that enacted the child health insurance mandate, although we recognize there are issues with it. You've got to start somewhere, and having a mandate is certainly a beginning. Then there are numerous states who are doing medical home implementation projects, and someone I know is going to talk later on today about the importance of medical homes. And then we also have states that are doing uh, things uh, around uh, enrollment uh, issues, specifically Alabama, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and North Dakota, and uh, also partnering with others. When I talked to Marsha Rawlerson, from Alabama about what they're doing, because Alabama is in that strip of states that always sort of gets a uh, not good rankings, but they're actually pretty good. I think they're like in the second quartile in the rankings um, from the um, Commonwealth study. And primarily, they've just really sort of taken it on in terms of getting a larger body of collaborators. And she said when they go out, they almost any opportunity to reach parents, whether it's an educational opportunity, it's a, a, a health fair, or it's a state fair, or anything, they always take people there to make sure they have opportunities for folks to enroll and know about it, uh, the health insurance. So they've really taken a real broad approach to making sure the information gets out at any opportunity they have to address parents. Um, and they, they've actually come a long way. So. In closing, what sort of seems like some of the themes that, that at least are, are by no means the only themes, these are the themes that I thought stood out uh, in the information. And that is, um, if you look at the adult uh, data and, and what happened in diabetes and hypertension and what progress they were able to make in those areas, it seems as though when we take time to say, okay, we're going to approach this problem and we're really going to, to, to get our strategies together in a broad brush, that we really do pretty well. The problem is just picking out the things that we really want to work on and we want to get to change. But if we focus and go stage by stage into areas, and for the academy, I think access is, a, is at the top of our list in terms of what we really want to focus on, that we're going to see some uh, real positive changes. The other issue is, I think, what we're all aware of, which is the silo issue. And I'm in education, you're in health, and you're in administration, and we're in, we talk to our own people, but we find difficulty talking across our silos. And we really do have to do that, and we have to see opportunities in the other silos for us to, to make progress in what we're concerned about. And what does that require? It requires us to change our behaviors. And I think that's one of the biggest, biggest uh, challenges. How do we as professionals make changes? How do we sometimes get, give up being in charge? Okay. Very often, I think, as, as physicians, uh, not necessarily pediatricians, we're probably not as ones who always want to be in charge like some of our other colleagues. But, but, but we're used to you know, sitting there and being the ones that speak up first and, and, and write out the agenda and get things going. But we've got to realize if we don't um, get partners who then have the ability and are given the support to sort of map out the agenda as they will and we collaborate with them, then we're really not going to be able to make the kind of progress we want to make. And the importance of families and caring adults, everybody picks up on how, how really critical that is. And for them, again, to be partners, not necessarily we take something to parents and how do you like that, but have them at the table to discuss it early on and really be partners in something. And, and critically, what we've learned from The Economist is not looking as though we're asking for more dollars to just be given. We're saying these dollars are investments. Now, you might not want to use that term right now, given the uh, Wall Street. <laughs> but of all the investments that have a good yield, it's children, you know. Um, and so I think that kind of, of um, approach to it and that kind of couching the language that we want to use very often with a legislator 
uh, is really an important strategy to take. And, and we don't want kids to be targets. When the cuts come, where do they want to go? They want to go to kids first. We have got to take that away. Kids to, can no longer be the target of cuts when, when the economy starts to go south. You know, you sort of have the sense of, you know, if we cut for children at the time when we emerge out of our, our, our difficulty, they're, they're not going to be people that can take over. And I think that's sort of what Dan's statement, his Abraham Lincoln uh, statement, was really about. Um, I take this slide only to point to the bottom here, which has to do with what something we've talked about and I'm sure we will continue to talk about, which is the political will to make change. And I think of all the challenges, that's probably our biggest, the one we go most to the legislature with, to the policy um, wonks with, is to really have the will to make the change and building the case for that. Um, the Children's Defense Fund has another strategy. They figure we should just elect a child president and then we'll <laughs> clearly have an ongoing investment and commitment to children. Um, but again, uh, the quote that I like to leave people with because I think it, if you're here, it means you want to make a change, is that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. It's the only thing that really ever has Margaret Mead. Thank you. Seems like we do have. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, just a comment first. Until we do have a child elected president, I hope Barack invites you to be on his cabinet. Don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, <But> I wish? <laughs> I think um, we we all. Uh, recognize that access to prenatal care is like the canary in the mine mm -hmm. and really sets the cascade going in a bad direction. New Jersey's taken a hit. It's shown up on some of the report cards of health. And that usually means we can anticipate further hits in terms of morbidity and mortality. In our own data, we see that people who don't have that access, who haven't been able to get uh, to prenatal care are the ones that have the highest issues of concern. Mm -hmm. And some of the more uh, adverse lifestyle issues, even something as simple as smoke exposure. Right. So the question I have as we focus down on children today is that uh, even though we're shining the beacon on here, do we not also need to figure out ways to interface with the larger picture? Because we're, mm -hmm. we're cutting into a cycle but we have to recognize the impact of that full cycle on the portion that we're looking at. And what are your thoughts on right. that? Right. Well, first of all, again, access is a major issue. And the um, legislative uh, work that the Academy has done most recently, or continuing their work called Medicids, which is their bill that, um, and their principles of, of, of uh, universal coverage, that uh, pregnant women should also be included in the uh, universal outreach coverage to start with because I really don't think um, given our economic challenges at this point that universal coverage will come all at one time. I think in all probability will come in an incremental manner and I think the first group uh, to be covered would be pregnant women and children. Now I know also um, even though it's not the area that I worked the most in, but I did go to uh, one of the infant mortality discussions that was held um, by the um, minority, um, HHS Minority Health Office. And they really talk about um, even pre-pregnancy care and really talking about what an impact we need, to, we need to make in that area. So I think that dialogue has certainly uh, been happening uh, in terms of our perinatal section. Uh, I went with the current uh, section elect for the perinatal section to really talk about, you know, at one point we used to do a lot of work in infant mortality in the academy and then the task force sunset it and the question is now given the change in what we're seeing as you're saying it's the canary and the canary is telling us there's a problem that we need to refocus some of our efforts in that area. 
Um, I'm a provider here locally in the inner city, and I, I think it's very important to pick up on that silo mentality that you're talking about because we've tried to get that on board. I think the AP really should push that because you can get a lot of data on teenage pregnancy, lead poisoning um, uh, prevention, um, immunization records from school nurses, and I think it's very true that you're getting this mentality where, okay, we've got all the information, but you're not getting it from us. We need it from you. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good point. Thank you. Question over here. Thank you, Renee, um, for coming today and taking time out of your busy schedule. Personally appreciate it, and I know uh, a number of the people in the audience do as well, and uh, certainly appreciative of all the work you've done um, during the past year as national president. She's my friend. She's biased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Putting in a personal point, but, but, but uh, um, certainly uh, I, I'm sure many people in this room share those sentiments. Um, the question I have is you did allude to the fact that uh, attention uh, had to be paid to the growing sentiment of the public's trust um, in the immunization program yeah. in this country and obviously it could have disastrous results. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if, um, I, I noticed when we go to these, um, anti, I'll call them anti-vaccine rallies, that we're oftentimes outnumbered. Mm -hmm. um, and if the AAP has any or any of the local or state chapters have had any success in forming public groups or public-led groups that are pro-vaccination. Uh, right. Um, I went to District 2 meeting, which is New York State, and they do have a, sort of a collaborative group they're pulling together. And you know the group that they brought in were the teachers because the teachers know those kids get sick. They're going to get sick, okay? So they found a real natural uh, uh, ally in terms of the vaccine issues. Uh, we also formed a National Immunization Alliance that some of the people in the Academy might have read about. 25 organizations, including the Academy, really bonding together to look at how we can get messages out. Because the standard way that most of us are used to messaging is not what young mothers are using now. Um, they're blogging, they use Web 2.0, they use strategies that are not our common strategies. And so we're working with uh, not only Every Child by Two, but Voices for Vaccines, the Rotary Club. We're working with a number of more lay type organizations because I think um, we need that type of uh, collaborator to really take the message out. I think, unfortunately, um, the public has been less trusting of the CDC, less trusting of doctors giving these messages. We need to align with parents uh, and other lay public to really help us get these messages out. Uh, Amanda Pete is, you know, is our first uh, a celebrity out of the box to do this, but certainly we'll be building on that. Okay, for now. I'm going to stay at the